my topic, my title, just for purposes of presentation, I cut it a little, and this is what it is, temporal and spiral pattern, the advanced pro and brown spiral. But uh, the only thing should be temporal and spiral pattern, the advanced pro, and the indications of the environmental plan and environmental spiral. Not this strict as uh, not in the program. So, when we talk about the plants of all parts of the world, so many studies have been done on urban related issues. Urban development, urban growth. But when you talk of urban growth, it is a specific type of urban growth. Urban growth is not the same as any other normal kind of growth. And this urban growth, just like any other type of growth in urban setting, is brought about by the increase in population. Worldwide, the population of urban areas has been rising right from uh, 1960, it was 34% it was according to the World Health Organization. Then uh, in 2014, it was about 54%, and in 2050, I think they brought approximately to be around 60 65% of people living in urban areas worldwide. So, this kind of urban development is characterized generally by um, low density. I cannot give you the exact definition of this urban sprawl because even scholars haven't defined it, but they describe it. And they, they describe it using the characteristics that it portrays and its, its impacts on land use. Um, so I came up with the specific objectives and one of them is to assess the dynamics of land conversions for urban development, urban municipality, and to assess the characteristics of urban sprawl and urban municipality. I didn't talk about uh, land conversion. Of course, land conversion means land cover change. And in this case, it is urban growth for this kind of urban development, urban sprawl that uh, we are looking at, how it has taken up, or how it has led to the conversion of certain land cover types to, other, to, to urban development, basically. So the research questions that came out of the objectives, one of them was to, uh, one of them was, what are the major causes of land conversions in Barang municipality? Then, what sprawl types characterize Barang municipality? Like I said before, urban sprawl does not have a definition, but it has a description. So this research is meant to, or this, uh, this topic or title, is meant to explain urban sprawl in relation to its characteristics. That's what it's meant to do. So uh, the study area, you've all had in Barra municipality, which is uh, in Barra district, southwestern Uganda, located about 266 kilometers from Kampala city, the Kampala Kavale Highway, and uh, Currently, about, I think, according to 2014 uh, population statistics, it is about, it has about 9,000 people. And it occupies an area of uh, 5,147 hectares with three main administrative divisions. It is one of the 22 municipalities. Okay, today, I okay, so again, I'm saying the president has, has accepted some municipalities. So it is one of the many municipalities in, Bar in Uganda. And uh, the three divisions, administrative divisions, are Nemitanga, Kampuzi, and Kakoa. Nemitanga, of course, takes the highest percentage of uh, land area, and Kakoa comes last. That is the study area, that is what it looks like from Uganda to the district itself, then to the three administrative divisions. So in order to determine the dynamics for land conversions for urban development, there are certain requirements I needed. First and foremost, I needed land site imagery. And that I got from the website for USGS. And the reason why I use land site imagery, because it's free and uh, it has so many spectral bands. And uh, the ones I got were on that, were corresponding, corresponding to the part 172 and row 60 for three different years. That is the period of study that I was considered, 1984, 1999, and 2014. 1984 being the best year because uh, 
like we all know our history, Uganda, because it's so good before that. But I imagine from 1984 at least was a fair year to start our study, my study, due to maybe it was the beginning of urban of the stabilization. Then 1999 is exactly 15 years from 1984 and also 15 years from 2014. So I believe it was a good year to evaluate and see what was happening. 2014, because that's when the study started, that's why it's most recent. So the characteristics of these images, uh, first of all, they were from three different sensors, Landsat 05, MSS, scanner, and then uh, Landsat 7, then Landsat 8, and you realize that the first image for 1984 was at a resolution of 60 meters. So I had to uh, I had to re-sample the image which are the same scale as the rest of the images to reduce the geometric uh, uh, discrepancies. So using these images with their bands, because they are different sensors, because they needed different combinations to create force cap color composites, and those are the combinations that are used for the three years, three images. Then that's what came out, the color composites. And I did talk about the shape file. So after resampling those that, that image from 1984, I used the shape file and then extracted the study area, which is that. That's what it appears like. Then after that, I went to classification. I started with the creation of an ISO file using the ISO cluster function, ArcGIS. And then I created six clusters. I created six clusters because they were that's what I was interested in, the environment. But these clusters, I got them from, um, I, I, that was in reference to the National Biomass Study of 2001, where they had about 13, uh, 13 land cover types. So I picked up the ones that I imagined would be necessary for me, and that's what I used. Maximum likelihood classification tool was also used in addition to that. These were the six clusters, the six classes that I came out with, built up area, forest area, swamps, grassland, bare land, and cropland. So that is what the classification looked like at the end. The representation of the colors are there, I don't know if it's very clear from where you are, but that is what came out. So, of course I had to branch, I had to find out how my classification had uh, come out. So. I had to put a field using a GPS receiver. I picked out 60 points to work as the reference data set against the remotely sensed or the classified images. And then I used the Kappa, something missing there. I used the Kappa statistic to compute that uh, uh, with the classification error matrix. And then I used the Z score to verify the reliability of the Kappa statistic. The overall accuracy ranged from 77% to 87% for the images with an average overall accuracy of 80.33%. So, according to Congleton and Green, 2000, 1999, they say that uh, if images give you a score, if the Kappa scores range between 0.4 and 0.8, that is moderate accurate. Then if it is 0.8 to 1, that is strong agreement. And given that these scores are within that range, the very close to that range, I believe this was a very good classification. Given that there were so many geometric discrepancies, the sensors were different. And uh, I came up with that. I quantified whatever I got out of that into this. The different classes were given, uh, they were converted then from pixels to hectares and then percentages. Then there was a change, percentage change for different periods, 1984 to 1999, 1999 to 2014, then the overall from 1984 to 2014. Then there was also the change per annum, how much each land cover was changing, whether negatively or positively, per year from 1984 to 2014. Then the land cover change for urban development, because they had to find out how much the urban development had eaten up each of these land cover types. I had to use the raster calculator with a 3D analyst where I used the 
Rasta-based relational operations. And then I, in, I inputted those scripts for the layer 1999, built up area for 1999, and put the land cover for 1984. I did the same also for 2014 user area to see how much that affected the land cover for 1999. So when I overlaid the two, they gave me an output map that had the values of 0 and 1. Now 0 represented areas that hadn't been affected by, uh, by new urban developments, so then 1 represented areas that were affected by new urban developments. And I Later displayed that I combined the two maps, the output, and then the original raster layer. That is what it gave me. Land affected, land cover type, so land affected by new built up areas by 1999. So this is what was affected on, to the, on the original 1984 map. You have grassland, that's what everywhere that you see great, that's grassland, that's what was affected. It was originally there in 1984, but in 1999, all that was built up area. That's the same for 19, uh, 1999, 2014 affected all that. Then it was quantified into this. How much had been taken up? That is why you have grassland having lost 36% during that period. For example, the cropland uh, lost 36 hectares, etc. The total is given there. So all this is what the urban area or new urban developments or future areas affected during these periods. So characterizing urban sprawl. What I needed to do this was the built up area of course, then the population statistics, then the review of documents, then the local authorities such as the Baramis Port Council, that's where I needed to get the information, then the layer of the road network from Baramis Party. Like I said earlier, urban sprawl has been characterized. And uh, because of its characteristics, that's where we get its description. And some of its characteristics, or how you measure its characteristics against whether it is uh, an area scrolling or not, you use the scroll index. And this scroll index is given by Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development by that equation. And when I put in some of the Values, for example, the population that I got from um, the population statistics that I got from the local government offices, and then uh, also the urban area that when I when I computed earlier and, and I got the size of the urban area or future area, I also inputted that, and then here you can see what exactly that scroll index means. Here it says that if it is equal to zero, when the value of the scroll index is equal to zero, then the population and built up area are stable over time. Then if it is larger than zero, then the growth of the built up area is greater than the growth of the population, and therefore the area is experiencing sprawl. Then if it is lower than zero, then it's not experiencing sprawl. All this the rate of sprawl that it is experiencing is quite low. So before I even go further, this curve describes the growth in percentage, how our municipality has been growing over time. That is a polynomial curve, and uh, there was a slight dip in growth between 1999 and 2014. And further, in my research, I noticed that it was because of the enforcement of environmental laws. That is why interbeat that was the polynomial kind of growth. So the score rate of our municipality, this these are computations of the sprawl index, first of all, and then the size of the built up area, square kilometers, because the equation needed me to convert to square kilometers, and then the population. So it was uh, 7.6, it's called 7.6 between 1984 and 1999, and then scored, scored nine, uh, negative 7.7 .7 between 1999 and 2014. And then overall it scored, 90, uh, scored negative 4.3. What do these mean? Between 1999 and 2014, there was a rise in population compared to the built up area. And this score is close to uh, cities in Norway. Cities in Norway scored up to negative 8.5. And Norway is one of the examples of compact growth in Europe. 
one of the cities that are examples of, it has one of the cities, some of the cities that are examples of compact growth. And compact growth is the very opposite of urban sprawl. That is why score D was negative 8.5. So a score close to negative 8.5, which is negative 7.7, .7, shows that Barrow municipality was actually had overcome that problem. But that is not our only area, uh, period of study. So from 1984 to 1999, the score was, was 7.6. And that uh, almost, uh, the, the cities in Europe that scored almost that were Portugal and Estonia. Estonia had 6.5. And those are areas that are experiencing sport according to literature. Then the final score, which is negative 4.3, Negative 4.3 squad shows that the area squad uh, about the same as cities in Switzerland. Switzerland loses about 12 sizes, football pitcher sizes, to advance ball every day, according to Ocha 2012. That is the extent to which varies sprawl almost. So strip sprawl, those are developments that occur alongside roads and I used buffers of about 100 uh, size from the road, 100 meters and that is an example of strip sprawl in Baram municipality in Nyamitanga division then next is the distance from the main municipality center that is also inaccessibility to one of the uh, characteristics of uh, urban sprawl the longer you walk and uh, that means that the density is reducing when you live in the municipality area, in the main municipality center. That is the canoe density of the built up areas. That, that shows clusters, first of all. This can conclude that Mara municipality is experiencing cluster sprawl because of these patches. And also, the development which occurs in the outskirts. The dark blue shows areas of concentration. Then the light blue shows uh, in areas of moderate concentration or moderate density. Then there is another one along, alongside the, the whole map. That is areas of low density. And of course, urban sprawl is experienced by, I mean, urban sprawl is characterized by areas which are not of high density. So these areas are experiencing sprawl. The ones in uh, light blue and then the other blue. Then I use the average nearest neighbor and the Moran's one statistic for auto coloration uh, calculations where I use the point map, combined point map for all the three layers. And then I came up with these scores. And these scores show I couldn't take it for granted that the area was leapfrogging. So the average nearest neighbor, when calculated, gave me a score which was 1.64 to the rounded that score. And this shows that the area is experiencing or dispersion. Then, Moran's one shows, it calculates the similarity, how areas, are, areas or values come together, how they relate to one another. When there are so many, it tends to cluster. And that score of 0 0.9 was so close to 1. And when it is so close to 1, it shows that the area is clustering. That is an example of improved development in the periphery, in the narrow division, I mean, in the in division, in the ward. Then that is a cluster sprawl. Areas that experience cluster sprawl are high density areas, but very far away from the main municipality center. Like you can see that. This can be residential areas, for example, which have almost everything, but they are far from the main municipality center. So, in conclusion, I can say that our municipality has experienced land cover dynamics. Then the variation in growth between 1989 and 2014 was due to environmental controls. Then uh, the increase in built up areas is possible for population growth and vice versa. Then those are the types of uh, sprawl that we experienced in Baram municipality according to this study. There is suggested areas of future research. Barra, the study was taken, uh, was undertaken during the development of the Barra bypass. And uh, with this development, there, are, there is expected to be a lot of uh, maybe land cover changes, so there needs to be study about this, how it's going to, to change the whole dynamics of growth in Bar. Then uh, the road network also needs to be used to influence the 
decrease wherever they need to be so as to increase density. Because Bara is trying to advocate for a city status, and once it is a city, it's going to incorporate, incorporate other divisions or other parishes. And with the incorporation of other parishes, these baby parishes will grow density. And that will increase the problem of sport. I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I think I'll accept two questions and please make sure your question is clear. If you know you are dozing, <laughs> see him during what is networking so that you don't just get confusing with what has already explained. But if you are attentive and understand it, please let's ask the question. Two questions. I know that this can be people from us. Let's have a gentleman on the other side. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll just need guidance. So if I get guidance, then I will provide guidance. Um, especially from the terminology. I'm getting confused uh, when it happens. Happens flow, build up area. In the explanation, I get it to be build up areas in the extent of structures. I think about use surfaces, whether it's uh, a pavement, whether it's a pair of coats here, a pair of coats in my ground, something like that. You just explain that it could be so by simply telling me how to define these parameters. Uh, secondly, um, on, the, on the results you get, the negative, the positive, do you think that it would have been influenced by the fact that your images don't have a consistent timing because the 1984 and 1999 is a difference of 16 years and then they are after? Do you think that probably it could have been both by the fact that they were not measured at the same interval? Or the other also is your population data. What, what, what population data do you use? 1984, did you use 1988 statistics? 1999, did you use the census or something? Thank you. Second person. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'd like to clarify that they are very important. What I would like to know is, uh, why did you select your eye and then this is how I can go to the panel? Why did you select all the work you do and why did you try to understand the panel? Okay. I'm sure it was the wrong way to ask. One question, just one.
from three different time periods and for, from three different sensors. So of course there are geometric discrepancies had to be there a bit, but that does not affect the results because there were reasons. There were reasons according to literature, the, 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 the growth in, for example, there was, a, in, there was an increase in the swamp line between uh, 1999 and 2014. And the reason as to why it increased, uh, as well as forest, yeah, there was also an increase in forest or forests. And the reason as to why that increase was because of the enforcement of environmental policies and laws. Those laws are there, those policies are there that were, that were evolved during that time. Yeah, and then the time I think that answered also that. Then the population data, <coughs> one of my data sources was the local government, Baramismality Local Government Authority, those offices. And uh, I went to the population officer himself, he's the one who sent me that information. So that's what I refer to for those periods. Then the Moran's one, Moran's one, it uh, sort of measures the degree of the first law of geography. It says everything is related, but things that are closer to one another are more related to each other. For example, this forums one can give you either a negative or a positive value. If it gives you a negative value, then it means that areas that are values that are similar are clustering within each other. For example, check checkboard, if you have chessboard, sorry, chess, if you play chess, they are black and white boxes. That is an example of a negative autocoloration. And the uh, moral one is the one that measures that. But if you have a positive coloration, that means that one side of the board will be black, the other side of the board will be white. And moral one measures the extent to which that is happening. And what I was looking for here is clustering, how built up areas are clustering. So I needed to bring built up areas together and then leave alone whatever was not necessary. That's why I used moral one. And it gave me 0 0.9, which shows that the closer number to 0 to 1 means that the area is clustering and not uh, this passing, if I can say. I think that's, that, I don't know if there are other questions. No. Sorry. Thank you, Brian. Let's give it up for 